He and I also put out a new policy on FISA this morning. This is something that's been ongoing, uh, a regular topic of discussion, and the president wanted to put something out. There's not much more than that. Sarah, uh, I'm not sure I got a clear answer from the Treasury Secretary to my question about what this administration hopes to achieve with additional sanctions on Iran. So I want to give you a crack at that. I'll wait until additional sanctions are made before I weigh in on uh, what that would look like. But as the Treasury Secretary said, we anticipate that that's likely to happen, and we'll keep you posted as it does and what that process will look like. Michael? Uh, yeah, we haven't made a final decision on uh, JCPO. ones would be outside of that. Obviously, yeah. Michael? Uh, back to... Sorry. Back to immigration real quick. Um, to yesterday, I guess, a group of House Republicans put out a, an immigration plan that would deal with DACA, but would also do a whole lot of things that weren't kind of under the umbrella of the four things that you guys outlined in the meeting yesterday. Um, was that helpful? Was that not helpful to, to getting to a, a, a deal ultimately? Do you, does the President wish that they you know, take that off the table so that you can focus on what might be happening with Senator Flake or others in the Senate. How does, how does a, a No, we think, that's a, we think it's a great starting point. We think it's a great, great place. Even though uh, it went beyond what the, the parameters that the president very specifically and then you later after He laid out the things he felt had to be included, not just what could be included. Uh, certainly, we think that this is a good starting point, part of the negotiation process. Um, if we could get everything done, we think that's much better than just getting part of it done. But we're okay with getting uh, a deal done as long as it falls into the parameters that the president but laid out. But he understands, right, that, that adding the extra things are what makes, what, what has the potential to make this more difficult because various constituencies think of those things as poison pills that are actually going to I think that's why that it's called a negotiation. Everybody puts everything on the table they want. Uh, you figure out what you're not willing to give up, which we've laid out, and you try to come out with everybody winning, which that's what we're hoping to do, both uh, Republicans, Democrats, the House and the Senate. We've laid out those non-negotiables for us, and we're going to move forward in that process you and hope that to get by there. The, by the end of, by, by the next week or so, or, does, or, does, or do I'm you I'm not going to put a time frame on it, but we certainly hope to get it done. I think the priority is making sure uh, that we get it done and we get it done right. Uh, April? Sarah, um, Secretary Mnuchin said that um, this White House has been working with businesses um, as it relates for a while, as it relates to this tax plan. And when it comes to Walmart, had, they, had this White House been talking with Walmart about a safety net for the employees that were going to lose their jobs today, because I'm looking at a sign right now from Sam's Club that says this club will be closed on January 11, 2018. That's today, the day that Secretary Mnuchin talks about how wonderful there will be increases in pay um, for Walmart workers. <coughs> I'm not aware about a conversation about a specific safety net. I can tell you uh, that we're excited about the fact that they've raised minimum wage. They have increased opportunities when it comes to paid family leave um, and that they are increasing salaries to over a million American workers. We think that's a positive uh, in terms of specifics on a safety net and conversations around that. I couldn't now, speak to that. Welfare reform? Is there a status report? Because I understand that uh, Ryan and uh, McConnell are not together on issues of welfare reform as it relates to education. Where does the president stand on this back and forth? We're having conversations about that. We think it's important uh, policy to look at. and But right now, our focus uh, primarily is on the budget. And secondary is getting a deal done uh, in regards to immigration on DACA and border security, and most likely uh, moving on to infrastructure from there. John? Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Two brief questions. The president said yesterday that, and I quote, we are going to take a strong look at the libel laws. Now, many lawyers said that was an unusual statement because all libel laws are at the state level and not the federal level. Was he referring to state should take a look at libel laws or something else? I think certainly states should take a look at it. Look, the president's frustrated uh, with the misreporting and fake news that is regularly takes place. Um, he is tired of the media's obsession over recent fictitious book on the president and his administration, and he thinks that when things like that happen, there should be some action of recourse. He's simply stating that it should be looked into. Well, Francesca, I mean, sorry. he meant the states, not that there should be federal libel laws. I think he was speaking generally that libel laws should be looked at. Right. My other question is, is the administration uh, 
have any reaction to the reports of the arrest of former Iranian President Ahmadinejad, who was leading a protest movement against the regime? Not at this time. No, John. Francesco. Thank you, sir. Uh, back on the president's first tweet this morning in FISA, um, when he said that it may have been used, the FISA Act, to surveil and abuse his campaign, what specifically was he talking about there when he said may and abuse and surveil? Could you point me in the right direction? Uh, look, I think that this is something we've talked about many times before. Uh, there are a lot of things that indicate that there was surveillance at Trump Tower, and um, I'm not sure what the clarification is needed on that front. Trey. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Two questions for you. First, um, a few days ago you said the White House uh, did not have any reaction uh, to the uh, transcript that was released by Senator Feinstein related to Fusion GPS. Is the President aware of this transcript? Um, and does he have any reaction uh, to the FBI uh, references within the transcript and what was said by that gentleman? Uh, we certainly think it's a um, gross overstep uh, by Senator Feinstein to release that transcript. Uh, there's been a lot of comments about obstruction of justice, and frankly, the only people that we've seen trying to influence the investigation are uh, former Director Comey and Democrats in Congress, and that would include uh, Senator Feinstein, Representative Schiff, who have both selectively leaked to the media witness interviews. We see that to be a big problem and something uh, that uh, should certainly be considered and looked at. My follow-up question. Uh, today, Ecuador announced that it's granting uh, nationality to WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Uh, does the president agree or disagree with this decision by the Ecuadorians? I haven't spoken to him about that. Sarah, Sarah, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Can I uh, ask you on, on, on Iran again? When the president went through the exercise in October of decertifying but uh, signing the sanctions waivers, he said uh, words to the effect of fix it or he wouldn't do this again. Uh, the fix was supposed to include some legislation which hasn't happened yet. Is the president comfortable with where the fix it part of this process is right now and, and what, what is his feeling about what a fix would look like? Look, the president still uh, strongly believes this is one of the worst deals of all time. Uh, and one of the single greatest flaws is that its restrictions leave Iran free in the future to openly develop their nuclear program and rapidly achieve a nuclear weapons breakout capability. Uh, obviously, we see uh, big problems with that. The administration is continuing to work with Congress and with our allies to address those flaws, uh, and we'll keep you guys posted as a decision on that front is made. Hallie. Thanks, Sarah. I want to ask actually about offshore drilling. But before I do, I'm hoping you can clarify something that you said a couple of times now, which is that a lot of people were confused by that tweet. So Mike Pompeo... Actually, Tom I Hunter, didn't say a lot of people. You guys said a lot of people were confused. I think was, you, we weren't confused, but some of you were. Some of you said. Yeah. yeah. So, so I want to ask about that, because Mike Pompeo was obviously out talking about this, pushing for this. Tom Barsh, a lot of people in the president's administration were representing the president's position on this, that he wanted this to pass. His tweet today was confusing. It was contradictory. It just was. So how are people supposed to trust, not us as reporters, but lawmakers, stakeholders, policymakers, that the people representing the president's position actually are? Um, I think that the premise of your question is completely ridiculous and shows the lack of knowledge that you have on this process. Um, I've, I've tried several times. I'll do it a, a tenth time here. Look, the president supports the 702, uh, but he has some very strong concerns about the FISA program more generally. Again, this is why he put out a memo last week uh, outlining such and why uh, the DNI director put out a new policy this morning. Yeah. I, I'm not sure what the confusion is there. I third Sarah, 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 that you Thank definitively you. are saying that the president's tweet this morning was, in your view, not at all confusing and not at all contradictory. You, you think that's an accurate statement? I just want to be very clear about that. Yeah, it wasn't confusing to me. I'm sorry if it was for you. Jake. Let me ask you about the offshore drilling ban, Sarah, sure, because there's ahead. been a lot of questions about what's happening in Florida. There have been other states that have pointed to the reason this administration is given for exempting Florida, saying that they also are not, they also would like to be exempt. So how is exempting Florida from the ban anything other, in critics' view, than giving a political favor to White House allies in a key battleground state? Uh, look, the president is a 
massive advocate for America not just being energy independent but being energy dominant. That's just part of that process is um, the offshore drilling. That's why it's opened up for public comment. These are going to continue to be negotiations. We're going to continue to look for places and ways that we can make America more energy dominant. If that's one of them, then we're going to continue forward in that process. Uh, that's why we've opened up drilling in Anwar, the Keystone Pipeline, and cut a lot of job-killing regulations that have to do with that. We're going to continue moving forward in that process. It's an open comment period, and we'll continue to talk with other stakeholders as we make decisions uh, for other areas and other states. Was was not a political favor? Thank it's you, not, as, I am not aware of any political favor uh, that that would have been part of, so no. Jay. Thank you, Sarah. On prison reform, the president recently commuted the sentence of a first-time offender, a father of 10 children, who had been sentenced to an excess of 27 years. What kinds of injustices does the president view as priorities? Uh, look, the president is looking, uh, one of the big topics of conversation for today specifically is looking at reducing the rates of recidivism uh, specific to helping reduce violent crime. Uh, this is a beginning conversation. This is to, um, a listing session, and uh, we're going to continue working through this process. But that was the number one topic uh, at today's meeting, and, and that's the big priority he has on that front at and, this uh, point. There have been reports out, and if you could please clarify, uh, what is Mr. Kushner's role in the prison reform initiative exactly? Uh, he's helping lead that conversation uh, and put uh, stakeholders together from a number of different areas that have expertise on this matter. I'll take one sure, last question. Sarah, Anita. Sarah. Can you just, going back to immigration, can you just shed a little bit of light on what's, what the holdup is? Uh, members of the Republican Party were in the negotiations. They're the ones who are saying they agree with Democrats. The administration has been in the meetings, at least some of them. So what is the, what do you all not like? Can, I believe there's only one member that said that there was a deal reached and the other members uh, are well in sync on the same page that we haven't quite gotten there, but we feel like we're close. Um, and again, we're going to keep having these conversations. The president had a meeting here uh, today with uh, a number of members, both from the House and Senate, Republicans and Democrats, as a follow-up discussion on immigration. and. Again, we feel very strongly that we can get a deal made. One piece that the president talked about missing, is that the issue, or is there not enough funding? Can you shed a little I, I, I think it's Democrats uh, agreeing to the other side of the deal. I think that's where we are. And, again, we're confident and feel like we're going to get there. Thanks so much, guys. Well, there you have it, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders wrapping up what turned out to be a very extended briefing, talking about everything from FISA surveillance to potential new sanctions on Iran to immigration. We, of course, will cover them all. I'm Trace Gallagher, in for Shepard Smith. Welcome, everyone. Deal or no deal on immigration? Republican Senator Jeff Flake of Arizona says a group of lawmakers from both parties reached an agreement on a deal to protect the Dreamers, DACA. The, th the hundreds of thousands of immigrants whose parents brought them to the U.S. without documents. But it appears that not everybody is on board, and the White House moments ago said a deal has not been reached. President Trump this week told lawmakers he would sign legislation to protect the Dreamers. He said he'd sign whatever bill Congress gives him, but then he later added the bill has got to include the wall. Still, Senator Flake told reporters that the president has mostly abandoned the idea of building a wall. He says it's more likely that a fence will go up along some stretches of the border. Let's get to the chief congressional correspondent, Mike Emanuel. He's live for us on Capitol Hill to sort this whole thing out. Hello, Mike. Hi, Trace. Yeah, good afternoon. It sounds like there is a small group of senators that has reached an agreement in principle, but there's still plenty more work to be done. Republican Whip John Cornyn of Texas says he appreciates the contributions of the senators, but the immigration issue is not going to be agreed to by just a handful of people. Cornyn says he has not seen the proposal. One of the senators trying to cut a deal talked about where things stand a short time ago. We're supposed to be meeting today uh, to set out a series. We have a, an agreement that we're the bipartisan group I'm talking about, the mm -hmm. six of us working, that we're shopping among our colleagues now. Uh, we don't want to release details until we talk to more of our colleagues. And, and that's it. One senator who's not impressed, Arkansas Senator Tom Cotton. Let's go to him. 2013, Democrats seemed so interested in border security. They talked about it, they talked about how important it was. All of them voted for a bill for $700 million of border security. Now it seems like they don't care about border security 
at all. Can you understand that what the difference is, what's There's, happened? There does seem to have been a, sh a shift in Democratic uh, elite opinion here. In 2006, Chuck Schumer and Barack Obama and Joe Biden uh, and uh, Hillary Clinton all voted for the Secure Fence Act. And you know, here we are just 12 years later, and we don't have that built, and there seems to be strong resistance among a lot of Democrats. What do you, what do you, think, it, what do you, what, what do you think it is? Is it simply just trying to play politics and deny uh, the president uh, a victory? I'll what let, is it? I'll let the Democrats speak for themselves. But I think We've most, been trying to. Most, none of them will talk most, to us. Most Americans realize that part of security at our border is a physical barrier. You can call it a wall. You can call it a fence. It obviously has to be supplemented by Border Patrol agents and technology, and that's part of the negotiations right now, but it has to include a physical barrier, as we already have in large or in several places along our southern border. So it's not just us. You've detected a change, too. <laughs> There's been a, a bit of a change since uh, Chuck Schumer voted uh, just 12 years ago for over 700 miles of secure double fencing at our southern border. Got it. Thank Thanks you. very much, Thank sir. You, Thank you all. So you heard Tom Cotton, Republican of Arkansas, conservative, who has basically been critical of any possible deal that this small group has negotiated. He wants a physical barrier at the border, which is something the president has been pushing for. And perhaps that's why we're hearing from a lot of folks that this may be a small group of senators agreeing on something, but there's still plenty of work ahead. Trace. What about the other side, Mike? What are we hearing from Democrats on this? Democrats sound very optimistic. You had Senate Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer saying earlier today that a deal on DACA, these young people who were brought to this country by their parents, is within reach, accompanied with some more border security. And the House Democratic Leader sounded hopeful as well, noting the president wants a deal. He supports the Dreamers, DACA, he calls it. Uh, that's okay. And um, wants to have some border security. We all know we have a responsibility to secure our border, so we could find our common ground there. That's all possible. I, I think people of goodwill are coming together on both sides of the aisle, both houses of Congress, to get the job done. It is important to note if and when there is agreement in the Senate that does not guarantee passage in the House, so there is still plenty of work ahead. Trace? A lot of work ahead. The chief congressional correspondent, Mike Emanuel, live for us on Capitol Hill. Mike, thank you. Let's bring in our chief White House correspondent, John Roberts. And, John, it's really no surprise that Jeff Flake's team and the White House are kind of on different pages when it comes to this, to this bill. Yeah, and Trace, not long before the press secretary came out here for the daily briefing, there was a meeting in the Oval Office that I'm told got heated on a couple of occasions when the senators came over here and they were presenting their plan for what to do about the Dreamers. Uh, the president said that he appreciated that they were talking in a bipartisan fashion, but when he looked at the plan that they had to propose, he said they have a long way to go. The president also took a call from Dick Durbin uh, on the, the uh, Democratic side of the Senate earlier today, said he's pleased with the bipartisan progress that's being made, but uh, they still have have a lot more work to do. So we sent everybody back up to Capitol Hill to say uh, you've got to get uh, a little more of what we want here at the White House into this plan before I'm going to sign off on it. Sarah Huckabee Sanders at the briefing a short time ago sort of summed up the White House position. Listen here. I can't speak to the specifics of Senator Flake. I can tell you that a deal has not been reached, and we've outlined uh, what a deal would need to look like on our end for it to happen. You guys got to come into the room uh, in a pretty unprecedented way and sat in there for almost an hour listening to the president talk about it, listening to the president commit uh, to getting a solution on this. Right now, we're counting on Republicans and Democrats to come together, which we think they will, uh, to make a deal on DACA and on border security. Senator Tom Cotton of Arkansas, who was one of the primary Republican point people on getting some sort of fix for DACA that includes border security, called the proposal that was presented to the president today a, quote, pine uh, needle of a deal, uh, or an Arkansas, uh, an Arkansan, or Kansanism that uh, Sarah Huckabee Sanders did not repeat. Uh, Cotton also said that this was a joke of a deal. The White House didn't go that far, Trace, just saying that they need to do better, they need to do more work before they come back to the president. Trace? Yeah, first time I'd ever heard Pine Needle. John Roberts, stand yeah. by if you would. The Thanks. White House is also weighing in on the president's apparently contradicting statements about a spy program. We will cover that and much more next. Well, the White House weighing in after President Trump seemed to contradict his own policy over a spy program. The House passed a bill to renew this program this afternoon, overcoming the fallout from apparently conflicting statements from the president and the White House. The Senate still has to take up the measure. It's known as Section 702 of FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, 
Last night, the White House pushed lawmakers to preserve the useful role it has in protecting the lives of Americans. Then this morning, the president blasted the law, tweeting, quoting here, House votes on controversial FISA Act today. This is the act that may have been used with the help of the discredited and phony dossier to so badly surveil and abuse the Trump campaign by the previous administration and others. Now, we should point out the co-founder of the firm behind the dossier told Congress that it is political rhetoric to call the information phony. Now back to the surveillance program. The president apparently tried to clarify his initial treat, writing, with that being said, I have personally directed the fix to the unmasking process since taking office, and today's vote is about foreign surveillance of foreign bad guys on foreign land. We need it. Get smart. Moments ago, White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders denied that the president's tweets contradicted each other. Watch. We don't think that there was a conflict at all. Uh, the president fully supports the 702 uh, and was happy to see that it passed the House today. But he does have some overall concern with the FISA program more generally. The president doesn't feel that we should have to choose between protecting American citizens and protecting their civil liberties. He wants to do both, and that's exactly what he's going to do. For clarity, the law allows the National Security Agency to spy on foreign targets without a warrant, even when they communicate with Americans inside the United States. Critics say it is a major invasion of privacy. Federal investigators say it's a powerful tool to fight extremism. Let's get back now to our chief White House correspondent, John Roberts. He is live at the White House. John. Trace, good afternoon to you. It was a real oops moment from the president this morning. And the reason why is because his national security team, led by the Homeland Security Advisor Tom Bossert, have been out selling members of Congress on the need to renew the 702 authority, saying it's an absolutely critical tool to protect the United States of America. The heads of all of the intelligence agencies also out there to convince members of Congress we need to have this thing renewed. And then the president sends out that tweet this morning, which contradicted a statement that Sarah Huckabee Sanders said, uh, last, uh, put out last night. It really seemed to criticize the FISA program altogether. It left a lot of people on Capitol Hill sort of reeling this morning, wondering where the president really stands on this issue. And it led to some avoidable moments, such as when the ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee, Adam Schiff, came out and said, well, listen, the president's saying all sorts of different things about this thing. Maybe we should put off consideration of the bill. Listen here. In light of the uh, irresponsible and inherently contradictory messages coming out of the White House today, I would recommend that we withdraw consideration of the bill today uh, to give us more time to address the privacy questions that have been raised, uh, as well as to get a clear statement from the administration about their position on the bill. Now, I talked to a number of people throughout the administration uh, during the day today about the difference between the tweet that the president sent out first thing this morning and then what seemed to be a cleanup on aisle 702 later on when the president tweeted out that he was, of course, supporting the 702 protections uh, and going after uh, people, foreign uh, targets overseas. Uh, I put that question to Sarah Huckabee Sanders today, who said, what are you talking about? Listen here. Can you tell us why his first tweet sparked off a flurry of activity and phone calls? I'm not sure about the flurry of activity. Again, uh, to us, that's a pretty normal day. And we're always engaged with members on the Hill, members of our staff. So that seems pretty uh, standard practice. Sarah Huckabee Sanders said that a lot of us in the media might have been confused about what the president tweeted out this morning, but she wasn't. Uh, I, I can say, and I have a great relationship with Sarah Huckabee Sanders, she is in the minority because, Trace, there were a lot of people, and many of them, up on Capitol Hill who had no idea what the president was talking about this morning, and a lot of people here at the White House who have been selling hard this idea of renewing 702 authority who also had no idea what he was talking about. Trace? And as I was reading in for the show, John, I, too, was with you and the rest of the people on Capitol Hill. I had no idea there was some confusion there. John Roberts, live force in the White House. John, thank you. Let's bring Thanks. in A.B. Stoddard. She is the associate editor and columnist for Real Clear Politics. And, A.B., you just kind of heard that back and forth between John Roberts and I. And whether intended or not, this clearly caused some confusion. But the White House says, no, it's absolutely perfectly clear. If you read them in context, it's clear. What do you make of it? Well, I think John's right. It's clear that it was 
<clears throat> I liked his line about clean up on aisle 702. It was the, the president corrected himself. He's done this before. He has made statements on Twitter without being briefed, and he's had to do a cleanup before, or others on his staff have done it for him. And when this kind of thing occurs, you often see this denial from uh, whether it's Sean Spicer in the past or now Sarah Huckabee Sanders at the microphone, um, pretending that um, it was all you know making sense and it was cons and it was consistent when it obviously wasn't. Yeah, but, but there is a point here to be made, A.B., that in the past the president has said that he is concerned about the civil liberties of Americans and it kind of wends its way into to the FISA bill. So there's a little bit of truth even in the confusion. Fair to say? But he needs to make it much more clear. Uh, he needs to discern between what is... Uh, the uh, legal capture of conversations that foreign, non-U.S. citizens are having overseas, and we have reason to be capturing those conversations, um, and, and what he is concerned with. And, and he obviously uh, jumped to a conclusion uh, that made it sound like he was opposing the renewal of this program, and that's why you had all this concern on Capitol Hill, and probably in capitals around the country, I mean, around the world. Yeah, and there was also some confusion. I mean, this White House briefing was, was pretty wide in scope. We had Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, starting out, and then we ended with Sarah Sanders. A lot of talk about immigration, about this DACA bill, and then Jeff Flake and his people came out saying, look, we think we've got a deal on this DACA bill, and then everybody, pretty much everybody in line, started shooting it down. I was telling John Roberts earlier, no surprise that Jeff Flake and the White House are on opposite pages, but this was, I mean, this was pretty stark contrast. Right. This issue is so tough. And obviously, the president deserves credit for earlier this week bringing both sides together in an open conversation that was all captured on camera for people um, with different viewpoints to try to come to a compromise on this. He did say he would sign anything that they agreed to in the House and the Senate between both parties. But we are not there yet. As Mike Emanuel said, we're really looking at um, a lot of different factions in the Congress between the parties, within the parties, Congressmen uh, Labrador and Goodlatte. Are are not on the same page um, as Senator Jeff Flake and Senator Graham are, they're, even though they're in the same party. Just because a group in the Senate comes up with something they can agree to that's bipartisan doesn't mean it's going to get the votes uh, over on the House side. Democrats are sounding like uh, the, the statements from Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic leader in the House, very conciliatory as if they want to get to a solution. But there's tremendous mm -hmm. pressure on the left, Trace, to, uh, to make this a big mm -hmm. government shutdown standoff um, and to not give on something that could actually be described as a border wall or fence. So I don't think we're cl um, close to the end yet. I just think that they don't know where the votes are going to come from. And just because a group um, of R's and D's come together and find something they think sounds great doesn't mean in the end it'll be blessed by uh, their leadership in both parties, both chambers. And even President Trump, who has gone on to a few separate positions right. on this uh, question of a fence and wall uh, in the past few days himself. And, and I got to ask you for your take on this, A.B., because there were a lot of questions about Iran, about these sanctions on Iran, and they tend to be confusing because the new sanctions that both Steve Mnuchin was talking about and Sarah Sanders, these are not with the nuclear deal. This is not to do with the big bank, um, the bank sanctions that really hurt Iran. These are sanctions about human rights violations, nothing to do with the actual nuclear agreement. Is that right? Well, they're, yeah, they're actually looking at extending the sanctions relief, but also applying pressure on the Iranians by bringing new uh, punishment, new sanctions for ICBM testing. So if there's missile, ballistic missile testing in the future, um, they would have to um, come under sanction for that. So they want to sort of keep the agreement in place and keep going, not break up the deal, but also apply new pressure on the Iranians. We'll see what the actual official word is tomorrow. A.B. Stoddard, great to see you. Thank you. Thanks, Trace. Well, more ahead on the confusion over immigration talks and whether lawmakers actually have a deal, as A.B. was talking about, to protect young immigrants. We'll talk to our senior producer for Capitol Hill, Chad Pergram, to help sort it all out. Coming up. Well, a lot of drama on Capitol Hill over the Dreamers, immigrants whose parents brought them to the U.S. without documents, and a lot of conflicting statements from senators on whether they have reached a bipartisan deal. Let's bring in our senior producer for Capitol Hill, Chad Pergram. And Chad, if I'm reading your emails correctly here, as it stands right now, the people who say there is a deal are standing by their stance, there is a deal, and those who say there's not a deal are standing by their position that there is not a deal, correct? 
That's absolutely it. And, and what you have is this bipartisan group of six senators who say they have an agreement in principle among them. I talked to Bob Menendez, Democratic senator from New Jersey, who said that now they're going to try to pitch this to other folks. Uh, John Cornyn, the Republican whip in the Senate who's, Senate, who's part of the other group that's been working. Uh, this is a leadership group that's kind of been impaneled by the uh, uh, president of the United States about uh, you know working on this deal by next Friday. He says, you know, you don't need six. You need 60. You need 60 votes to break a filibuster. And you need to get bipartisan buy-in on both sides of the aisle. You need to get a lot of Republicans on board here. That's going to be the problem. I went to Tom Tillis, a Republican senator from North Carolina, when we were hearing rumblings that there may be a deal here. And he said, well, they're wrong. So this is going to take a while to sort out. So I'm confused, Chad, because you're saying that even the six are planning to pitch this to the larger body. If, if they're planning to pitch this up the chain, that would mean that they're admitting there so far is not a deal, right? And we don't know what those details are. They're saying there's a deal in principle among those six, but that's the, not the same deputized group of John Cornyn, Dick Durbin, who's part of both groups. Uh, you also have Steny Hoyer, the minority whip in the House of Representatives, uh, and Kevin McCarthy, the majority leader. They have been working with John Kelly, the White House chief of staff, trying to work something out. So, you know, you have people kind of riding in both cars here. And again, the key is to get buy-in by Republican senators. What this is going to come down to is what will the president accept? How far will Republicans be willing to bend on DACA? And how far will Democrats be willing to bend on immigration policy? Yeah. Chad Pergram, our senior producer on Capitol Hill. Chad, good to see you. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you. Well, President Trump was scheduled to meet with his national security team this afternoon, and we're waiting to hear whether he announces a decision on the Iran nuclear deal. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson said a decision is coming this afternoon, and minutes ago, the Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin earlier said he does expect more sanctions against Iran. Rich Edson is live at the State Department. Rich. Well, Trace, the State Department is describing the meeting at the White House as a decision meeting on these Iran nuclear deal uh, uh, deadlines that are upcoming that the White House uh, has to figure out. Aides are pushing the president, some of the aides are pushing the president, to continue waiving sanctions against Iran, essentially keeping the United States in the Iran nuclear deal, even though the president has called it an embarrassment and the worst deal ever. But the aides' point is that uh, it keeps the U.S. in the deal while the United States Congress continues to deliberate on how how to change U.S. Iran policy. They're looking at a host of different things, perhaps changing the deadlines and structures uh, into the president's certifications on Iran that keep coming up every 90 days and, and just as often. Uh, also, stronger enforcement of the deal and perhaps wrapping in the ballistic missile program in Iran to the way that this operates. So that's the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, it seems likely the president may keep us, the United States, in that deal, uh, at least for now. On a separate end, the United States, though, continues sanctioning Iran for its other behavior that doesn't involve the nuclear agreement. That's what the Treasury Secretary was talking about today, in particular, Iran's support of terrorism and its ballistic missile program. Are you expecting uh, any new sanctions on Iran to come from the Treasury? Uh, I am expecting new sanctions uh, on Iran. We continue to uh, look at them. We've rolled them out, and I think it's, uh, you can expect there will be more sanctions coming. We have as many sanctions on Iran today as we have on any other country. Now back to the nuclear agreement, European countries that also signed on to the Iran nuclear deal met with Iran today in Brussels. Uh, they're basically pushing the United States to stay in the deal. Back to you. Rich Edson, live for us. The State Department, Rich, thanks. The battle over federal surveillance program could also cause trouble for the effort to avoid a government shutdown, right? A Republican senator is threatening a filibuster with the deadline for both bills just over a week away. We are live in Washington with that. Next. Well, the fate of a controversial spy program is now in the hands of the Senate after it made it through the House earlier today. But Republican Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky is threatening to filibuster a bill to renew the program, saying it violates Americans' privacy. Our senior producer on Capitol Hill says that could blow up the effort to avoid a government shutdown next week, both federal funding and the surveillance program are set to expire next Friday. The chief intelligence correspondent, Catherine Harridge, is live for us in Washington. Catherine. Well, thank you, Trace. The legislation now heads to the Senate, where it will meet resistance from Senator Rand Paul, who, as you remember, protested government sur surveillance, pardon me, on the floor in 2013.
You know, I don't know if I have 13 hours in me. I've been through a lot in the last couple of months, but I will tell you this, that the Bill of Rights is something worth filibustering over and that the idea that we should have a judicial warrant before searching an American's records absolutely is worth filibustering for. After the 9-11 terrorist attack, Section 702 was approved by Congress to maximize foreign intelligence gathering on individuals and groups like al-Qaeda and more recently ISIS. This program sweeps up phone calls, emails, and text messages of foreign citizens living outside the United States. But some lawmakers say there's simply not enough protection. And that is that we support the integrity and the importance of 702 as a national security tool, and we want it reauthorized but we want it right. But our job and our task is also the protectors of the Fourth Amendment, and that is the protection of the American people against unreasonable search and seizure. One amendment introduced by Republican Congressman Amash tried but failed to limit the FBI's ability to search the database, which does include U.S. citizen information, but it's collected by accident. That's where you get that term, incidental collection. But the bottom line is that the Senate's on a real tight timeline for next week, not only with the continuing resolution to fund the government, but now also with uh, the 702 FISA legislation, Trace. Tick tock, tick tock. Catherine yeah, Harris for live sure. for us in okay. DC. Catherine, thank you. You're welcome. In Southern California, rescue teams still searching for those missing after devastating mudslides ripped down the hills, carrying away homes and cars. Have you seen the pictures? And some survivors now talking about what it was like when the earth started moving. Terrifying noises. It sounded like a hundred people with huge logs slamming into the house every three seconds. Dear friends of mine, my, my gardener's family, his wife and um, kids, we don't know where they are. And just ahead, we'll take you to one of the spots hit hardest for a look at the rescues and the plans for recovery. Mudslides and flooding have killed at least 17 people here in Southern California, and crews are still searching for missing people in the wreckage. Emergency teams say hundreds of rescue workers are wading through mud, with search dogs also helping out. We're now learning officials did not send out alerts to cell phones until just before 4 a.m. on Tuesday. That's after the mudslides had already started. The emergency director for Santa Barbara County, north and west of Los Angeles, said officials sent out warnings by email, social media, and news outlets in the days leading up to the disaster. But officials say only a small percentage of people in the area followed a voluntary evacuation warning. One woman said she's still waiting to hear from her parents, who stayed behind during the storms to celebrate her father's 89th birthday. This is in Montecito in Santa Barbara County, a firefighter standing on a home surveying the damage with mud and rocks halfway up the house. And somebody posted this video showing a car caught in a mudslide in Burbank. Look at this. That's just north of L.A. You can see it go flying around the corner and down the hill. The driver tells the local TV station he and his passengers made it to safety. Let's get live to William Lajeunesse. He's in Montecito right near Santa Barbara. William, what are folks up there saying? Well, you know, Trace, whether it's a hurricane, a tornado, you know, a wildfire or a mudslide, it's a cliche, but people are amazed at the power of Mother Nature. I mean, these boulders weren't here. The trees that you see knocked down, those weren't here. That was all coming down with that mudslide when it came off of the San Inez Mountains, found the Thomas Fire and all that mud. So what do you have right now? You have uh, places that look like moonscapes where houses have been literally neighborhoods wiped off the map going to that evacuation controversy you know people closer to the burn areas up in the mountains well they were under a mandatory evacuation people downstream where i am closer to the water the ocean rather they were under voluntary now the county said it put out those emails put out the weatherman uh, the local guy he said there's going to be rains of biblical proportions Many people just did not listen, but they didn't do that that uh, emergency system on the telephone till after the uh, until it after the uh, mudslide started, and that is the source of the controversy. Here's what one man told me today. I don't think people didn't listen. I think people listened. I think a lot of the damage and destruction. This is a voluntary. That's a mandatory. 
this street is the dividing line of voluntary and mandatory. So if I lived in that house, would I necessarily think if they're going to be okay and if I'm in a voluntary? So I don't think it's people's fault. I don't think yeah. people. I think this is a natural disaster of biblical proportions. They call it disaster fatigue after the fire. Um, fighting fire is expensive. Cleaning up one is as well. Trace. And William, what about people still looking for, for missing relatives and all that mud? Well, you know, it, it's, we're on day three right now, and, and the viability of the people who are still missing has been called into question. They still call it search and rescue, but um, it's going to be tough because um, there's hypothermia. This mud is very, very cold. We did speak to one woman, and she remains hopeful. I think their house got uh, washed away, and I hope they got out by a rescue team or maybe some neighbor or something picked them up or someone, and they're just maybe they can't reach us right now. That uh, she's talking about her mother and father. I will tell you the 101 freeway between LA and San Francisco going to be closed till Monday. That is a huge headache just for local traffic, but as well as across the state of California. I will tell you, Trace, there is so there are so many dump. Every dump truck in California has got to be here because they are hauling this soil and mud out of here. You know, every two minutes, and the bulldozers, the uh, the uh, the um, uh, all the heavy equipment in here is just amazing uh, as they try to get this back to normal, but it's going to be a while. Back to you. Yeah, for now, if you want to go to Santa Barbara, you got to go up through Bakersfield and then come back down. William Lajeunesse live for us in Montecito. William, thank you. Let's take a look at the forecast for the area. Get to the chief meteorologist, Rick Reichmuth. He's live for us in the Fox Extreme Weather Center. Hey, Rick. Hey, Trace. Yeah, I mean, it's been feast or famine for the last couple of decades, really, across California. They haven't been able to buy any rain much this year, and then all of this rain came very quickly and just that little bullseye uh, up around some of the mountains just to the north of L.A., right exactly where that burn was, and that's the recipe here. I will tell you, now we're going to go back into the no-rain phase, which is certainly good news uh, in, in the short term here across Southern California. Conditions looking really quite fine. Uh, no moisture coming in, at least to Southern California for over the next week. We will see a little bit in towards Northern California around a week from now, uh, but overall, things looking pretty good, at least for the rescue efforts and for the cleanup efforts, Trace. And the winter weather is set to hit some other parts of the country, right, Rick? Yeah, you know what? That exact same storm now is ejected out across parts of the central part of the country. Remember, we had that cold air across the east? Well, it warmed up a lot, at least temporarily. The cold air is coming back in. There right is very clearly your cold front, 62 in uh, St. Louis, and go just to the west of it. Temps are into the teens. These are your current temperatures. Factor in the wind. We're back into this thing where it feels like minus 31 in Fargo, and this is all part of that same system. Now, you see all this moisture... A lot of very warm, moist air coming in here, and that is bringing rain right now. It's also eventually going to bring some ice. We have icing concerns. Uh, here's the forecast precipitation. This pink, that's